Welcome back to News Talk here on News Channel 8 in our conversation this Wednesday with former D.C. Police Chief, former Philadelphia Police Commissioner Charles Ramsey. We'll be going to the phones, your questions and comments for Chief Ramsey in just a moment. Eric in Falls Church, uh, stand by please. We'll be taking your call first. And I'd love to get to as many calls as possible. Grab an open line if you'd like to talk law enforcement, policing, community uh, safety, what have you, with uh, Charles Ramsey. Our number, as always, 703-387-1020. Uh, you were co-chair of the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. I can imagine that the issues you and I have been discussing here are, are at least some of the issues that that panel dealt with, and I guess the goal there trying to advise both the White House and local law enforcement on best practices? Yeah, federal, state, and local law enforcement, actually, we had a total of 59 recommendations, 37 of which actually applied directly to state and local. Uh, but we. Um, I think put together a very, very good report considering the short time frame we had in order to do it. But the issues that we've talked about uh, earlier, building trust and legitimacy, policy and oversight, uh, training and education, social media and technology, I mean, all these things are critical issues facing law enforcement today. And we're working our way through this in order to be able to come out stronger, better, and really more responsive to community concerns. In uh, acknowledging the uh, in in in, all, in making a victory speech in New Hampshire uh, just <clears throat> last night, Donald Trump talked about the attack in Paris. <clears throat> pardon me, and said that if there had been more bullets going the other way, in other words, uh, from the victims, from the the, the concert goers, and the rest, at the assailants in that horrible attack, fewer innocent lives would have been lost. With 47 years of policing, frontline mid-level management and chief in some of America's largest cities with all that experience to draw on are you ever tempted to weigh in and talk about whether this notion of the good guy with the gun uh, takes out the bad guy with the gun whether that's uh, a theory worth of, worthy of pursuit whether that's uh, uh, whether that's something that that should we should adopt as kind of a central tenet of our of our thinking on second amendment issues or you know do you do you are you more a classic gun control guy is is this an area where you at this point in your career are comfortable speaking out well i mean i would describe myself as one that's in favor of responsible gun ownership more so than just straight gun control but let me kind of play that scenario a little differently mm -hmm. here you're the police officer that arrives at the scene of something like this now you've got 10 people that are firing at random. Nobody knows who the bad guy is necessarily. The cops aren't going to know who's who. And now you've got all these bullets flying um, in all directions. How does that make a situation safer? I mean, it's not that simple. And people want to break this down into something very, very simplistic, and it just isn't. I'm not anti-gun. I don't have a problem with uh, lawful uh, gun, gun ownership and so forth. But then to say that we need to arm all teachers in case you have a shooting at a school or arm all this or arm all that because they could take care of it. I mean, imagine the chaos that some of that um, entails and the fact that we have so much gun violence in this country. How many times is it going to be used inappropriately simply because there's an argument that takes place between people? How do you view the debate over concealed carry? Well, I mean, listen, it's six and one and a half dozen and the other. We have concealed carry in Philadelphia, almost 30,000 people that are registered uh, gun owners that can carry a concealed weapon. We periodically have an issue that comes up with someone who has a license. Usually it's associated with being in a bar, too much to drink, argument, those kinds of things. Maybe it's road rage inappropriately displaying. But our problem isn't as much the people who are lawfully carrying guns as it is people who are illegally carrying guns. So it depends on the jurisdiction and their own personal thoughts and feelings around that. I would like to see us have less guns in our society, but I don't think it's realistic to um, think we're ever going to get there. Do we have um, Eric on line two? He was uh, calling in from Falls Church, wanted to talk with Chief Ramsey. Uh, if, if, if we do, Eric, are you there? Go ahead. Uh, yes, I am. Hi, Thank welcome. You. Hi. Uh, first, I just want to say, Bruce, I really enjoy your interviews, so uh, it's really uh, enjoyable. Thank you. And uh, hello, Chief. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Good, good. Um, I have a question. I'm a disabled American in northern Virginia, and I'm interested in maybe working part-time, maybe administration level or something, or office help for uh, a local police station, say, Alexandria or Fairfax or some other local uh, station. Uh, I mean, uh, precinct. Sure. Um, what's the best way for a disabled person to do that? Is there special programs or liaisons to talk to, or do you just go in and apply normal channel? Or uh, 
Sure. Eric, thank you for the, for the kind words, and thank you for coming well, I, with your question. I don't know about those two police departments, but I can speak on behalf of the ones that I have worked for. A person who is disabled can apply for a civilian position within the department, uh, and if they're, if they're qualified, then obviously they can be hired. It's not a problem. Uh, they are not eligible to become sworn members because they can't perform necessarily the full range of functions of a police officer. But there are a lot of people that are in the civilian ranks of police departments across this country that are disabled, that are invaluable uh, to the day-to-day -day operation of a uh, police department. So I would encourage you to apply um, if that's what you want to do. Um, dispatcher, call taker, records, uh, you know, uh, crime labs. I mean, there are all kinds of opportunities in policing for people. And you can see why. I mean, you you get the sense from Eric that it's a it's a line of work it's a it's a way to serve the community that would be exciting and yeah. valuable and it doesn't necessarily mean uh, being a frontline officer there are other as you say roles for people to fill sure yeah um, chief I'm curious to ask you about Kathy Lanier someone mm -hmm. who came up through the ranks while you were the <coughs> chief of police for the while you were leading the Metropolitan Police Force she was a frontline officer for quite a while on Georgia Avenue, I believe. At what point did you come to meet Kathy Lanier, and when did it occur to you she could be a, a leader and perhaps the top cop in a big city like Washington? She still, I think it's fair to say, is regarded as something of a rock star here in the nation's capital with something of a national profile. Well, it was um, not long after I came to the district that I, I met Kathy. I don't know the exact first encounter. But I do know that she leaves an impression. She's very, very bright. I think she was a lieutenant at the time, newly promoted lieutenant, and just clearly one of the bright stars in the department. And one of the things I noticed when I took over D.C., most of, a lot of the talent that we had, I mean real talent, was really locked into the sergeant, lieutenant ranks, and some of the lower ranks, and they just needed to be kind of brought along and given some more experience. Uh, I promoted her several times. I mean, I, I put her in charge of narcotics. I put her in charge of the 4th uh, Police District. I mean, uh, special operations after 9-11. I knew I needed to do a total revamp of that. She's young, bright, energetic. She would go in there and turn it around, and she did. She created the Homeland Security uh, Unit for the Metropolitan Police Department. I was so happy to see her become the next uh, police chief. I just can't tell you. But, yeah, she does have a national profile, rightfully so. Um, I would call her a rock star amongst her peers uh, as well. She's very, very talented and very good. Lucky to have her here. After 9-11 and when you reflect on events like what happened in San Bernardino, it's clear that uh, folks at the local level, at the officer level, special operations, SWAT, whatever, uh, they've got to be prepared for anything and everything because folks are going online, they're seeing, they're getting uh, energized and radicalized by different ideas and it doesn't have to be someone who's uh, coming in from yeah. Syria uh, to harm us. Uh, the homegrown uh, uh, concern is clearly there. Well, I mean, it's a challenging time, not just in terms of police relationships with the community, but also real threats that we face out there, uh, whether it's terrorism, uh, crime that's starting to kind of unfortunately uh, tick upward in many of our cities. So it is something we really have to keep an eye on. Um, it is a challenging time for all of us and you know it kind of goes back to an earlier conversation we had in a sense almost touched on it one of the criticisms police had especially after Ferguson was this whole notion of militarization of police uh, you know officers with you know uh, military type vehicles weapons and so forth but you look at the range of things that police officers have to handle we call 911 it could be dealing with a traffic accident or it could be an active shooter in a school now, if you've got an active shooter in a school, I don't think you want the cop to show up with a clipboard and a flashlight. You want him to have the right training. You want him to have the right equipment to be able to resolve that situation with a minimal number of people killed or seriously injured. It's policy. It's mm -hmm. training. It's under what circumstances do we deploy the assets that we need. How much of it is relationships, too? Officers, knowing people in the community, uh, people at a high level, whether it's chief or other people at the very high level of the department, having informal and softer interactions with people so we we it's not just in the crisis or not just when we're pulled over that we encounter and deal with somebody from law enforcement well you know one of the strengths that Kathy Lanier has is her personality I mean she's very interactive she's very engaging likes to get out there I mean if you could clone her in terms of attitude with all your police officers and many many officers in fact the majority of them are similar in terms of wanting to interact but that's really where the rubber meets the road that's what you need and it needs to be at the ground level more so than actually at the top of the organization, although the top 
needs to drive that philosophy uh, downward. Well, you've got to be able to build relationships. That comes from one-on-one -on -one contact, getting to know the people that you serve. Chief, in all, in all candor, you don't seem very good at, uh, at retirement. Yeah, do you right. have Do you have one left? Do you have? Uh, are you? Would you do it again? Would you be chief again? Well, I, I'm not interested in running another department. I, I've served as a major city chief for 17 years. The average tenure of a chief is only three and a half, four years. So you could say I'm on borrowed time. I don't know. But uh, I think I can play a larger role in helping departments across this country deal with these challenges, doing what I'm doing now, and that's working and consulting. Uh, with other agencies. And you're here in D.C. Uh, tonight. You're, you have a, a speaking opportunity before the National Law Enforcement Officers uh, Foundation or Memorial, and I guess the crowd there will be looking forward to hearing hearing you talk about a lot of the things we've been discussing. Well, you know, there are a lot of challenges. They want me to talk a little bit about what I've seen over 50 years, but mostly focus on the challenges that we've talked about here today. I hope you'll uh, come back and visit. As I said at the outset, it was always great having you here when we were, when the show was just getting launched, so to speak. And uh, anytime you're in town, we'd love to have you back. Well, thanks. Let's don't wait another nine years. That's right. <laughs> Charles Ramsey has been in law enforcement, as we said, nearly 50 years, the former chief here in the district, now advising uh, Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel and other uh, big city mayors. Thanks so much, Chief. Great to see you looking great and I hope you'll come back and visit real soon. Thank you. Thank you sir very much. A live look at the hour's top stories and that frigid forecast next and then why Trump and Sanders scored so big in New Hampshire and what it means going forward.